everyone. Welcome to the live stream on Corporate Purpose from the Network for Business Sustainability. The live stream will run for an hour. My name is Tima Bansal. I'm the Executive Director of NBS as well as Professor at the Ivy Business School. I will be your host today. I would like to start by acknowledging the land on which I live and work in London, Ontario. These are the traditional lands of the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, the Lenapewak, and the Attawandaran peoples. For generations, they have cared for their community, the land and the waters, and continue to do so. I wish to pay my respect to the elders and acknowledge their status as First Nations of Turtle Island. The Network for Business Sustainability aims to bridge management research with management practice. So for the next year, NBS will engage in a number of these live stream events that will pull together the communities of research and practice to tackle important topics in business sustainability. We welcome your feedback, so please do look for the link uh, to, to place your comments. As well, please put your questions on the comments during the discussion and someone from the team will relay them to us. And there's an unbelievable amount of expertise that's in this room today, and not just the people that you see on the screen. So ask the questions and others might answer you as well. We want to build a global community. So on to the matter at hand. On March 8th, 2021, Danone's chairman and CEO, Emmanuel Faber, stepped down because of pressures from hedge fund activists. This attack on Faber, who is a well-known champion for purpose-driven uh, companies, raised broader questions about the ha hazards of a purposeful corporation in a world driven by investor activists and short-term returns. This is not the first time that investor activists have prioritized the short term to gain uh, over the long term sustainability or even long term returns. One of our speakers is Mark Desjardins, who's an assistant professor at, the, at Penn, State's, Penn State University's Smeal College of Business. He found not only that short term hedge funds are more likely to target purpose driven corporations, he also found that these hedge funds were successful in stripping the company of assets and building short-term returns, 7.5% in the first year, but that the share price fell by 10% by the fifth year. And that's substantial. That's pretty damning evidence for corporations that want to retain long-term purpose. But Chris Marquis, one of our other speakers, has written extensively on purpose-driven corporations including a book he has just completed on titled Better Business, How the B Corp Corporation is Remaking Capitalism. He is our second speaker and is a Samuel C. Johnson professor at Cornell's Johnson Graduate School of Management. I got through the whole thing, Chris, without stumbling. He argues that it's possible to navigate through these landmines placed by short-term activists. And whether it's through B Corp's legal status or employee ownership or other ways, he has really good uh, uh, experiences on, on how to navigate. And uh, he offers a counterpoint to Emmanuel Faber's experiences at Danone by citing examples, for example, of Paul Pullman's leadership at Unilever, uh, who was attacked by Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway and 3G Capital. There are clear indicators that things are changing in recent years. There's a story of engine number one, a small hedge fund that owned only 0.2% of ExxonMobil that was able to turn the company upside down because Exxon's failure to respond to climate change. There is real change afoot. And there's also the US Roundtable, which is 200 companies, America's, America's largest companies, that have said that the corporate purpose is about to serve stakeholders, not to shareholders. And no one gets this better on the ground, in the flesh, than Louise Keller up Roper. She is the CEO of Volans, which is a leading consulting company for purpose-driven organizations. And she has background as well, her own experiences in two other B Corps, and that's Method and G Diapers. And so she will be another one of our speakers. Louise works with forward thinking business leaders to support and accelerate their transformation. So in today's discussion, we seek to reconcile these opposing trends of long-termism and purpose in corporations with short-term pressures from investors. 
Are we truly headed to a place of smoother sailing for companies looking beyond their bottom line? Or do purposeful leaders need to batten down the hatches to fend off attacks and avoid the fate of Emmanuel Faber? So with that, I want to start with where most uh, live cast or people end is with advice. I want to ask our speakers the question of what advice would you give to executives committed to purpose? Why don't you start, Chris? And you have to unmute. I think after a year, I would be used to unmuting. Um, so anyways, thanks so much, uh, Tima, for having us as part of this live stream. You know, appreciate you also plugging my book. And I think, you know, my advice really is very much in line with what I wrote about in the book. And it's really two different strategies that I think that companies can take to really embed purpose deep in the DNA of the company. Uh, and this is why actually, even though it's unfortunate that Mr. Faber uh, was pushed out of Danone, that I think that I'm still very optimistic about Danone because the two items, um, and these are actually part of the broader B Corp model. So in my book, I don't advocate necessarily that companies should be B Corps, although that's great, but some of the aspects of the model are very useful to, uh, for all companies to become more purpose-driven. One of them is accountability. You hear a lot in the news about ESG measurement, management, metrics, et cetera. So companies should begin, even if it's just one or two things, start to measure, track, a variety of ESG metrics. And we can go into the details of, of what all that is, uh, you know, as the live cast uh, progresses. The second is governance structures. So there are now a variety of different types of governance structures, new types of companies that exist throughout the world in the US and Europe and South America, and just recently in Africa, uh, that actually put all stakeholders on the same sort of legal playing plane as shareholders. I think these two items, accountability on ESG and stakeholder governance are the key ways to sort of bake purpose into the DNA of the firm. I love that. Okay, very practical. Louise, what do you think? Well, of course I have to agree with Chris because I don't think anybody could argue against those um, points there, but um, I guess to, somebody committed to purpose, I would talk about it. It has to be at the heart of the company, um, absolutely. But also know that having purpose isn't enough to being a purposeful company. And we've seen an evolution in purpose from kind of marketing slogans behind receptionists um, to now sort of the second wave, as I see it, over the last couple of decades, where you have to get the employees bought in and, and empowered to live that purpose. It has to come down to a, you know, a, a North Star so you know what to do in your job, really. And the way we, we've we looked at that is you have to start with the purpose and the values and then build down into governance, as Chris mentioned, but also incentives and tools that start driving and supporting um, employee behavior. Um, so that's, the I guess, the first piece. Um, the second piece I would say is you also have to make sure you don't let go of the tools to meet traditional financial requirements, because I think we'll come to that when we talk about the non and others, that you can't just say I'm purposeful now and, 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 and just focus on that. And I think most execs would get that. And then just the third point that we often talk about purposeful businesses as being these big um, multinationals, but there is a real difference in, in um, trying to turn around or add purpose to a company that has existed for, for years with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of employees versus some of the challenger brands, um, some of which I've worked for, where you start and the company is born with purpose as a B Corp. And, and, and there are really different um, challenges, both challenges for both though, but yeah. I look forward to unpacking that a little bit more, Louise, but I just want to, you gave an example to me earlier that I liked, it was about employees, and you said about Monday morning uh, yes. sessions. Do you want to tell us well, about that? <laughs> sure. Um, so one, you know, I talk about incentives and people very often jump to, oh, I need to um, um, 
based compensation on purposefulness. But actually, what you have to, to tailor it to the organization. And we saw with a, a large Japanese group we were working with that one of the biggest incentives for getting people working towards um, sustainability and the, and the new purpose of the company was Monday morning meetings, having a star of the week talking about what they had done and that spurred that whole culture and behavior so much faster than putting a rule in or paying people a little bit extra you know not saying you shouldn't pay but but you have to kind of work those incentives out and it's about the history and the culture of the organization we see quite different things working in different organizations yeah the formal structures that um that uh, mark talked about and then the informal pieces that you're talking about louise are important mark what about you yeah, thanks. Thanks, Tima. And I just uh, echo what Chris said. I mean, thanks for having us in this, this session. This is good so far already. Um, yeah, so I, I give two bits of advice here to kick us off. One is um, more about strategy and talk about integration. And the next is um, background in investor relations and being a CFA charter holder, I have to say something about finance. And that's about investor relations or shareholder management. So integration, what do I mean by that? Sort of builds on what uh, Chris was saying about integrating uh, purpose or sustainability at the core of the company. And by doing that, I mean, I truly believe that when you do that and when you, it allows you to think long term and in the long term, everything comes together. So stakeholders, the environment and financial value can all work, coexist and be maximized where in the short term it, that that doesn't happen. So integration is about um making sustainability at the core, allowing that long-term thinking. And then the second piece would be around investor relations and managing shareholders and expectations. So, um, you know, if you can integrate sustainability, then that can allow you to maximize financial value while you're doing great other things, maximizing environmental, social value. But when you um, manage investor relations, that allows you to go sort of, I would say, even above and beyond to have purposeful investors and capital that supports your mission. Um, and so, you know, you mentioned Danon, and we can come back to that. Uh, but when you have investors on your side, that allows you that even in the short term, if you're doing things that we would argue, we would all agree that are creating value, social value, environmental value, but they're not being reflected in the share price. If you have investors on side with that, then that gives you that freedom to do those things and let those let it all converge in the long term. And so the integration for the financial side, the investor relations for the social and the environmental support to do the things that you need to do as a purposeful organization. And, and Mark, that the last bit that you just told me about the investor relations, I think is actually the most interesting, uh, in, in a way it's the biggest pain point, right? Is the hedge funds, and we'll stick with big corporations right now. I'd love to talk about small organizations at some point as well, but in the big corporations, it's really hard to manage investor relations, especially when you have hedge funds that own less than 1% that can still end up uh, influencing the organization's chairman and CEO, right? How did, I know that you know, uh, you've talked to Emmanuel Faber and uh, did some work with Danone, as have the others in our panel, but can you just tell us a little bit about that story of Danone that for the audience members that don't know? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's a good question too, like how it happens, right? I think Bluebell Capital and Artisan, which like led Bluebell, which tar was the activist hedge fund that targeted Danone, $90 million asset under management, um, engine number one in Exxon, engine had $250 million asset under management. These are tiny investors right, that own just a sliver. So it's we, we can come back to that about how that happens. But um, yeah, with, with Danon, um, I mean, I met Emmanuel Faber in 2017, right about the time that Danon was targeted by Corvex, which is uh, an American activist hedge fund. And this wasn't Danon's first run-in, but it was um, Emmanuel Faber's first run-in with an activist hedge fund at the head of Danon. And you know, his big question was, he was, you know, how, he was really sold that like, you, this is a purposeful organization. This is Danon at its core. This is where we're going. But how do you maintain that purpose under these short-term pressures? That we are getting a lot of pressure from this activist hedge fund uh, to cut costs, to become more efficient, to get that short-term share price up. Um, and then, you know, we saw that again, a few years later, just recently, four years later, um, where, you know, Emmanuel Faber's fate didn't work out as well as it did uh, with that, that first run in with Corvex in 2017. Um, but it was exactly with, with the non around that tension of 
maintaining purpose, creating a lot of value around the social, the environmental side that's not reflected in the share price. And ultimately what that came down to is, you know, there were a lot of comparisons between Danone and some of the competitor share prices that it wasn't there in that short term. You look at the graphs and it's, you know, one year of slumping and you could make the argument that, you know, the value is much more when we reflect things that aren't in the share price when we consider those. But um, yeah, ultimately, ultimately that's, uh, that's what happened there. So, but you're saying that purpose costs money. And that was, and that's why the share price didn't go up as much for Danone as they did maybe for Nestle and some other competitors. So it does. So we go back to my opening comment. Maybe this is where we, you know, have a conversation. But um, it, I, I'm a firm believer. It does in the in the short term, right? It's not an immediate reflection. But when you think long term, to have a business that is maximizing financial value, you need the environment around. You need your st- stakeholders around. You need all that. But to build those relationships and those investments, that costs capital in the short term. And sometimes you take little bumps for that, that, you know, don't keep your stock price meeting or exceeding every single quarterly earnings benchmark. Chris, Louise, do you want to jump sure. in there? Sure. So, I mean, I think this really illustrates the problems with this sort of Wall Street short-term shareholder primacy model. I mean, it's destructive. Uh, the fact that these very small investors can just focus on their own short-term profit, you know, as you mentioned, you know, what Mark's research shows is that, you know, there's, you know, when there are these attacks, you know, the price goes up in the short term, but actually it's destructive to value in the long term. Uh, and I think that is really where we as the society uh, and potentially as a government need to actually say this should not happen. Um, you know, it's just simply out of greed that these people are, are doing this, in my, in my opinion. And so I think, you know, something that like the, the Danone case, uh, I mean, I'm, I mean, I think it's just as, as, you know, very, you know, it's very regrettable that this happened. But, you know, to the points that I mentioned in my opening comments, uh, I think that, you know, Emmanuel Faber was very successful in walking the talk over a long period of time changing the corporate form of Danone, which passed with over 99% vote, not these you know, criminals in some ways who, who ended up forcing him out. Um, they uh, became you know, a number of the Danone subsidiaries, I think about 45% now uh, of Danone's you know, sales have become uh, B corporations. They've aligned the global company KPIs around the B impact assessments of ESG baked in the company. Uh, they do things like have, you know, the bond offerings that actually pay differentially based on their carbon and social impact. So, you know, Danone is an example that really has embedded these structures into, into the company in ways that few other companies have done these ESG and social impact purpose structures. And, you know, it's just a shame that they exist in this world where these small investors can, can force them out. But I'm still confident about Danone over the long term. So, Louise. Yeah, I, I was going to say, so am I. I think, I think one of the positives um, uh, of the Danone story is that they will remain an entreprise à mission, um, so a B Corp, so to speak, um, which they, you know, I think they endorsed in 2019, am I right? Um, and they will continue with that. The lesson, I guess, for, for, for many CEOs out there and um, is about getting your investor, <laughs> your investors on side and figuring out really carefully what is it they're looking at setting the right metrics. I was talking to um, uh, the CEO of a, of a global um, energy company last week. Um, and, and he said, well, actually, you'll find that so they've gone through a transformation over 20 odd years. And, um, and now in the last five years, probably three even, their investors have changed. So he said, we used to have maybe one ESG investors, one person who was interested, but he has worked tirelessly to get more patient capital into that, um, into that business so that he can make those decisions um, that are right for the long term to make the capital investment. And doesn't mean they're not under pressure. Doesn't mean it's not a lean company. But but investors as a stakeholder, and I could see there was something in the chat about how do you manage stakeholders, um, all these different stakeholders. Investors, as Mark said earlier, has to be one of the key ones in order to give yourself that space to um, 
to invest to work out what this transition is. Um, we've, you know, we've done a lot of work on this for the last three years, and most companies don't know how to speak to their investors, right? I think it's just a new skill for CEOs and, and top management is how do you do that? How do you get them on side for longer term? So when uh, Paul Pullman came in, uh, and when was that, 2008, I think, maybe you can correct me, that he yeah. had um, a large percentage of ownership was through hedge funds. And he actually mm -hmm. did exactly what you said, Louise, that he was able to shift it to patient capital. I would love to learn how companies shift investors from, you know, the these uh well, hedge funds that seem to be, you know, attacking to patient investors. Mark, you know something about that with investor relations. I'd love to, how, how does a CEO do this? Yeah, sure. I mean, I remember when Pullman came in and I mean, the beautiful thing, you know, something like he said something along the lines of like hedge funds have a place in society, but no place in a company like ours. And, you know, that's risky as a CEO, right? That's huge. You saw this, the hit in the stock price. Um, but yeah, be, before, um, uh, before doing my PhD, becoming a professor, um, I was in investor relations and, you know, a lot of that is who do you give your time to and what's your messaging? So when you're an executive and you're going on the road with your uh, VP of investor relations and your CEO and your CFO and your CSO or whoever, then it's where are you spending your time and how are you attracting that long-term capital and what's the message you're giving to those investors rather than, you know, well, we're going to be great next quarter and our earnings are going to go up this by this percent. So, you know, you should buy our stock. That's not the type of investor. You don't want to sell an investor on that case versus like, here's our transformation plan. Here's why we're going to outperform in the long term. But, you know, we need your capital. It needs to be patient for that. So it's about changing that investor base, but that takes a lot of effort, as Louise was saying, a lot of communication, a lot of time, a lot of training for executives of, of how to do that. Yeah. And guts, right? Bravery. You know, I remember last year, the CEO of BP, Bernard Looney, he announced that they were going to cut dividends to shareholders in half. Um, from sort of, but what he did was he based it in that new narrative that Mark is talking about. He said, this is our longer term strategy to become an integrated, environmentally sustainable company. And you can say a lot of things about BP, but that, that was both brave. And he got a lot of flack in the media um, for this, because again, we, all of us have our pension funds tied up in these big companies. So we want, the, you know, th there's, there's some really interesting dynamics going on. Um, so nobody wanted him to, to lower dividends, but but he did it with that long-term narrative. So I think Mark's point about narrative is absolutely crucial um, in this play. And I, if, Tima, can I just add, Would I mean, to, to make that a bit more concrete too, like beyond the narrative, it's like explaining what you're doing as a company that's reflecting your view towards sustainability about where you're going. So a close friend of mine, uh, Mark Thompson, he's the chief strategy officer of Nutrien, the world's largest fertilizer company. And he also oversees that company's sustainability and all that goes on. And so something like that, rather than having, I mean, and he's very clear, we talk about it. He says things like, you know, there's no such thing as ESG risks. There's just risk. Like everything, everything ESG is the core of this company. Um, and so, you know, even structural, how, when I go back and talk about integration, it's like sustainability isn't some department that's off somewhere sideways, just giving to this charity and that charity one year, but like explaining to investors how it's at the core, we're all talking about purpose at the core, sustainability at the core and organizing for that and then communicating that too in that narrative. I just, I think that's really important. I think uh, just to punctuate a point that you just made um, is that the uh, sustainability portfolio was under the chief strategy officer uh, activities, right? And so awesome. it, it's not off into separate, you know, marketing or under government relations, whatever it might be. So I think that that's really critical. Yeah. Um, Louise? I was just going to add a very tiny point because I feel like Mark, we need to bring Chris back into the conversation. But the uh, um, so one of our clients, Athiona, which is a global um, Spanish uh, headquartered infrastructure company, they have just um, combine the portfolio of sustainability and finance with the CFO, right? So he is now CFO and CSO, which again, it, it shows everybody that you're putting the, that transformation and sustainability uh, at the agenda in the center of the company, not something add-on as you're saying. 
Chris. Yeah, I'll just say, I mean, I totally agree. And I'm, I'm going to say something that actually disagrees, but I do actually really <laughs> agree with what sort of Louise and Mark are saying. I mean, I think, you know, the Danone case, unfortunately, does point to that there are broader, more systemic issues that exist. Because I think that, you know, the narrative, the structures, I mean, Danone was world class, best in that. They passed, you know, my French is not as good as yours, Louise, so I won't say the type of company, but they have a, the, the new French benefit corporation type of company. They were the first large company to be part of that. That passed with shareholder vote over 99%. Now, the, the people that pushed Danone, so, so the narrative that Emmanuel Faber was doing, the structures were totally on target, but still these very, very small hedge funds were able to to uh, to put to push him out. So I think that you know companies need to continue down this path. And I think exactly the way that Mark and Louise said, but I think that you know there needs to be some more structural type reform um, as well. The the piece that you haven't made explicit, but certainly implicit in whatever you've said, is that there's a trade-off. And either you pander to the hedge funds and you say, we're going to have these short-term returns and you know, look at my quarterly profits, I'm doing so brilliantly. Or the CEO is going to say, uh, you know, this is a long-term company, we get sustainability, we're going to reduce our ESG risks and all other risks, whatever they are. But that means that they're going to lose their short-term investors. And they lose their short-term investors. Mark, you said that the share price then falls. So there's a trade-off between having a higher short share price and maintaining that higher share price with long, short-term investors or saying, I'll take a short-term hit for this long-term gain. Is that right? A trade-off then oh, between the two. I'm going to get in before Mark because Mark will probably have the data on this. Um, the company I just spoke about, um, it, well, actually not Athiona, but, but Neste, the renewables company, mm -hmm. I know that their share, share price has been going up and up and up, even though they've definitely got a long-term view, long-term purpose, and are attracting more ESG um, investors. And so, what kind of company is Neste? Uh, just because so it, our audience so may know. Yeah, sorry. It's the, what was the um, Finnish um, oil company, the big state-owned Finnish oil company, which has now transformed itself into this big renewables company. So they're, they're creating um, renewable diesel from waste and, um, um, yeah, from, from waste resources, mainly both for aviation and for, for cars and, and trucks. So the long term, or sorry, the, the share price has been going long, up and up and up because they've yeah. actually switched to a different. Uh, yeah, well, 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 again, they, they not necessarily because they've switched again, their transition. And this is what we can't forget. It's a 20 year transition, right? They've, they've been at this for a long time and they're not there yet. But I'm just saying that they certainly haven't seen um, a downturn in the share price as far as I know but again that's one story um, and one company I know fairly well because we work very closely with them but but Mark might have data to say there's always a trade-off um, I don't know yeah I mean if we if we break it down I don't think there there always is a trade-off if you manage it well so it goes back to your comment earlier Louise about like managing the narrative and how do you transition because it's a transition right a lot of companies now in the world we live in they're they're they have a history. They've done, we you know, saw this with Exxon and trying to transition towards a more sustainable company as we've realized the importance of this. Um, and if we break it down like stock prices, they're essentially dictated by supply and demand. And if you've just come out and said, you know, short term shareholders, they have no place in a company like ours and you don't really have a long term plan, well, that's going to sink your stock price. But if you're transitioning towards this message, of where you're going as a company and investors are seeing that value and that's slowly bringing in more demand from long-term investors than the stock price, it can keep rising through that transition. But you know, that's a delicate balance and how CEOs handle that. You know, this uh, uh, reminds me of if you're running a race, right? You're gonna start off fast and then beat your competitors in the, in, at the outset. And you got the other guy that's taking it easy and going slow. And not slow, but you know, taking it at his own pace, longer term, that will win the race in the end. And so I think that that's really the story that you're telling is that uh, you have to be willing to go slow and let others beat you in that short term to get the long term returns. And that's what Neste is seeing ultimately. That's what Paul Pullman saw ultimately with Unilever. 
But that's not what Danone experienced. And that was why ultimately Faber was, uh, was asked to leave so sure. that they didn't have that long to return. Chris, please. Yeah, you know, we're talking a lot about sort of from the company perspective. And I think that this race also, um, you know, applies to investors. You know, something I've been doing some, some reading about recently is this concept called universal ownership. I don't want to get too sort of wonky um, in our discussion, but basically nowadays, investors are hugely diversified. You know, most investment in large developed market, uh, market economy markets is institutions. And actually the return for these companies is basically a result of the overall market, which suggests that they should actually care a lot about these like pollution externalities, health externalities, that it actually, their portfolio as a whole is affected by, by, by the long term. So they're in some ways by acting really short term are acting in their, not in their self-interest. If they actually saw their overall investment as a portfolio, um, you know, they would much more recognize, um, much more recognize the long-term needs. And I think there is a lot of work to, to educate investors on this na nowadays. Uh, and so I think this is a, a real, a, an area that has a lot of potential for investors to really come to understand that, you know, their returns are, are about the whole market and the, the whole market Every, the, the, the tide rises, uh, you know, mm. the, all, the boats ride, the boats uh, all rise oh, with five. the tide. So, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm sorry. sorry up Chris, part. can you just give me uh, the universal ownership? Just uh, describe what that is. Sure. So, so the idea is that, and, and Mark or Louise might actually have a better explanation. I'm just sort of starting to learn about it a bit myself, uh, that because all not all, but, but the majority of investors nowadays are these huge mega investors like mutual funds, pensions, whatever. This is like 80 or 90, 80 percent of the of the market basically is owned by these large institutions because their portfolio is so diversified that actually, uh, you know, they're basically just tracking the economy. They're not necessarily, you know, like getting rich off of one stock going up or not. And if they're tracking the economy, that means then that, uh, you know, these ex like pollution externalities, healthcare externalities, et cetera, actually end up getting reflected in the companies that they're owning. It might not be Danone, but these other hedge funds might ha have other companies that the externalities are affecting. So, so it's, it's an argument based in solid data that, actually all investors should be basically long-term because they're holding the whole market. Interesting. Mark, you were going to say something. Yeah, I'd love to jump in there. I mean, this is why I think the research about like some of what I've done, some of what other people have done though is so important, like looking at those long-term uh, returns because, you know, I was, I was at a conference a couple of months ago and talking on this, like the returns to at hedge fund activism. And I was speaking to a bunch of heads of different U.S. pension funds. And, you know, trying to educate them that they're actually hurting themselves. Like, Chris, you bring up a super important point because you, we have 20 years of research of like finance studies looking at, they're doing uh, event studies looking at the stock price within 20 days of a hedge fund campaign. Of course, it goes up five, six, seven, eight percent. But when you look five years out, like if that's how you're making your decision based on 10 days, you're really hurting yourself. So, I mean, that's, that's important. The, the other thing I just add in, I mean, everyone on this call right now, uh, I'm, I'm constantly like perplexed at the number of people I talk to, students, friends in the classroom, that they think so much about where they uh, buy things and not where they're investing. And we talk about all those evil activist hedge funds. Well, who've been the largest drivers of growth in activist hedge funds is pension funds. And who invests in pension funds? Well, it's individuals. And so I think it's, it's really important when we talk about this, how do we think longer term, that shift in capital from an individual perspective, rather than saying, oh, it's those investors over there. Because I think it's each of us being careful with where we're investing and what we're supporting. But yeah. anyways, that's kind of a, a tangent, but something that I think is important. And no, very important. important. <laughs> Look at us both. Um, I was going to say, and it links in a sense to, um, to something that Chris brought up earlier about this, the systems failure, right? Because pensions should be long term. You know, you look at um, a lot of people, not all of us, but have quite a long term until they need to draw their pension. 
and so they 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 are patient in a sense and yet the short termism um and the incentives for the intermediary from you buying your pension and all the way through means that they, they're all short term as far as i can see um incentives so they're pushing for that rather than the individuals and actually i think two years ago a, um, a big campaign in the uk called my money matters is trying to address exactly that um Mark, trying to make people aware of where are they putting their pensions. But it is that systemic piece, right, that it, it, the system is trying to drive everybody to short termism. Hence, we have the hedge fund versus um, the other way around. I'm going to just change a path just a bit. And and it relates to an audience question as well. But uh, and, and also Chris's research, um, both in his book, but then also some of his academic work as well. But how do we really know what companies are doing? Because, okay, I'm gonna have the right narrative as a, as a CEO. I'm gonna tell companies, that my investors, that I'm investing in the long term, but can I be trusted? Because there's so much, there's benefit and I can actually talk out of both sides of my mouth, in fact, short term and long term. Chris, how do we know? Yeah, so I think, you know, I don't know who this is attributed to. I've heard Ronald Reagan, I've heard journalists, but, you know, trust but verify. You know, I think it, I think, you have to you have to demand that companies measure, track, report, and are transparent on these issues. Without that, uh, you know, even even the best intentioned companies, I think, will stray. You know, there was this uh, business roundtable announcement in 2019. You know, the business roundtable, this group of the 200 largest uh, company CEOs in the United States. They did this statement that business should not be just focused on shareholders, but should be focused on stakeholders, the purpose of the company, stakeholders like employees, uh, communities, et cetera. You know, in the pandemic, a number of these companies have been sort of outed in some ways for, you know, dropping their employee pensions, dropping their employee health care while they're paying more dividends. And, you know, so it's ex ex sort of exactly the opposite of what this uh, statement said. And I think, you know, I mean, it's good to identify those, but I, and I think that maybe when they signed it, they were, they really had that intention, perhaps. I'll try to be optimistic about it, but, you know, if they're not actually sort of measuring, tracking, and reporting on it, it's really easy to fall into the old systems. I mean, this is a new system that we're creating, and so to do that, to create a new system, you need to create sort of the processes and procedures. And without that, I think it's it's natural for companies to just end up greenwashing, which, uh, you know, is not good uh, in many ways. And it's a transition that, you right. know, it takes that time. 2019 was only two years ago, and there's been lots right. of activity since then with COVID. Yeah, so, it's tough here. Yeah, it's tough. But nevertheless, I think it's really hard to know. Anybody else want to talk about authenticity or how do we really know? I mean, I, th I think I would jump in uh, just, just quickly is that, yeah, that, that helps like from an individual perspective too. I mean, one thing we have to keep in mind and it, it goes back to like my days in investor relations that like these institutional investors, they're really smart and they're spending a lot of time. And when they're investing, it's a lot of meetings. It's a lot of, you know, what are you doing and crying and trying to figure things out. So, you know, we never like, we never ask the question, well, were companies like just lying when they're talking about like building a factory in that country and growing that. It's almost like it can be as transparent as that. Where are you investing those dollars? How are you structured for sustainability? What are you transitioning to? And you know, we have to trust that if we're investing our dollars in the right institutional investors that are reflecting our values, then they're sort of the ones that are really able to get to the core. But from a consumer perspective, I would say it's, you know, it's pretty tricky when you see the commercial on TV and you think, oh, that's a green company. You know, that's not too, too trustworthy. I know with Paul Pullman, who came in, like I said, I think it was in 2000. Uh, Eight that he um, uh, they, it took him a long time, and then I was telling a friend the other day, and uh, you know about Paul, uh, the stuff that you know Lieber's been doing, and they said, well, you know, what about uh, fair and lovely, right? The stuff that whitens you, and so they, it's yeah. just really hard to transition to a whole different perspective. And that was thirteen years in the making, so it's hard to change. Yeah, Louise. 
no, I was just, I, I, I think the guys have covered it and, and you, you know, it's about detail and, and transparency is, is huge. I think the, um, the only thing to, to add, I, I guess, is and maybe it's my optimistic nature, is most people do want to do the right thing. And most companies are, are aiming that. But we, we, we are in this middle, uh, middle of this transition period and we are asking for simple answers. Are you good or are you bad? And we're, we're not really taking into account companies that have existed a long time who have procedures and, and even getting the data. I know we talked a little bit about B Corps, but even getting the data to become a B Corp and to start measuring yourself is incredibly hard for, for any size company, um, particularly big ones. So, so the, we are in that mix. And I think that puts a little bit of onus on all of us to take nuance. Louise, you're optimistic, though. You said most companies are trying to do the right thing, but here yep. we are in this world. Uh, we're in serious trouble right now, and we can't sort of we can't deny the possibility that within eight or ten years that we could see temperature changes to a point that are become mm -hmm. untenable. We are so, in a crisis, right? Right. And we and we have to. So I do think they want to do the right thing, and that's why. What's really interesting about this time we're living in is that we have governments who've now started committing um, to um, to carbon uh, emissions reductions. We have companies, we have banks, we have investors who are waking up to all this. We have young people on the streets for all sorts of brilliant reasons, and and all of that is needed. So we all. I, my belief is that that all of us, whatever role we think we play in society, and remember CEOs are, are dads and, and investors and consumers too. And mothers. Uh, well, yeah, I know. I, <laughs> I, I, most of them are still dads. You're a CEO. <laughs> uh, but, you know, and, and I think we all have to step forward and be activists in, in our own way. And that means stepping outside of, of this role of being one thing and let me just leave everything to, to other people. We have to, to, to push forward. And, and, and the good news is most people are in, in, in different ways. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, there's this, it really is a nice segue into the future, right? So what is that transition and what it looks like? And I want to tie that into one of the audience questions too about listening to the more marginalized people on the fringes. And that becomes increasingly important, I think, about the future. And I know, Chris, you've talked a lot about a different form of organization mm -hmm. and that change is coming from places that we don't expect it. Well, why don't you just say a little bit more? Sure, I mean, I think uh, part of it relates a little bit to what Louise was mentioning in, in her opening comments that, you know, this is an evolutionary process. And I think a lot of our discussion so far has been about large public companies and how to change those public companies. And I think that's hugely important. I mean, the effect that a company like Danone or Unilever can have, is gigantic. these are, you know, tens of billions of US dollar a year companies. I mean, these are giants. Uh, but there are thousands and tens of thousands of smaller companies that are the tomorrow's Danone, tomorrow's Unilever, uh, that are sort of imprinting these ideas in their DNA from the beginning. And it's, it's a lot more effective to start with social impact, environmental sustainability, and grow the company with that as a core than it is to try to change it later. And I think, you know, this is a generational play in many ways, I think. And if you see, you know, and the people might say, oh, that's, you know, Dan and or Unilever are going to be on forever. And they've been around for a while. But if you look at something like the S&P 500, the Fortune 500, you know, actually most companies die. Uh, you know, they go bankrupt, they leave, they get bought by some other company. Uh, so I do think that actually this model of large, small com companies that are small, medium-sized now, growing over time, and actually becoming the dominant companies is is an important lever for change. And this is really this year, I think, started to happen in, in an unprecedented way. So many of these companies with social impact, you know, governance, benefit corporations, B Corps have started to go public in unprecedented numbers. So just in the last year, you know, 10 have gone public. Before the pandemic, there was one total. So it's been sort of 10 times uh, what it was before. And I can imagine given how many of these companies are in, you know, BCPE portfolios, 
uh, you know, there's going to be hundreds of these companies going public in the next com- in the coming years. And so I see these companies as really where the hope and the change is. You know, I, I hear you advocating for that we should just let the bad companies die and uh, and allow them. <laughs> no, no, to- we got to change them. But I think it's, you know, I'm, I'm more optimistic about the about the newer companies. Yeah, cool. Anything to add to that, Louise, Mark? I mean, I would, I would just ask, uh, you know, Chris, when those companies, do you see them standing up to the public market? So after they, you know, when they're private and they're growing, that's one thing. And then they go public and they're dependent on institutional capital, which can affect any company. And almost arguably, it's even easier when you're a small company because it doesn't take as much capital to take a larger stake and influence that. Like, how are they going to stand that, you know, stand for the long term? I think it relates a lot to, to what you were discussing, Mark, about sort of educating or sort of having a message, educating the investors about what the company is about. Uh, so I've talked to a number of these companies that, uh, that have public benefit corporation governance that have gone public or transitioned from a C Corp to a PBC over the past year. And this provides a real effective signal of, to, to investors, uh, let, let alone the actual governance aspect of it, but also it it's a signal uh, to help sort investors. Uh, you know, I don't know, I haven't looked at who the large owners of, the, of these companies are, uh, but my guess is that the short-term people uh, focus hedge funds when in the S1, which the companies have to issue when they're going public, it says, you know, a risk to our model is that we're a public benefit corporation and this means that we may not have the same short-term uh, returns as other companies, you know, may turn some of those, some of those investors uh, away. So in addition to what's said on the roadshow, et cetera. So there is, you know, language about this actually in the, you know, in the IPO documents uh, and really emphasized a lot by the executives. There's some uh, really cool questions that are coming across the, the feed, so to speak. Uh, and I'd love to just tackle them relatively quickly. Um, there is a, a one about, it's about governance and the pursuit of long-term purpose. How critical is shifting governance towards stewardship ownership models? And so that would be probably employee ownership. I know, Chris, you talked a little bit about that, but other types of ownership models, um, cooperatives, and then there's this other aspect of separating ownership from control. So that would be CEO separated from chairmen, chairman of the board, um, chair, chairs of the board, I guess. Uh, do any of you, I know Mark at the very beginning, you, uh, was it Mark that was talking? Uh, no, Chris, you were talking about governance. Did you want to say anything more about governance in general, any of you? I, yeah, I do think it is tremendously important as both the substance of it, but also as a signal about what kind of company it is to, to, to investors. And to your point about employee ownership, I think that's also a very, we haven't really talked much about that, sort of a little bit separate from what we're talking about. But that is a, I think, really important model because every other form of ownership, be it family ownership, you know, um, you know VCPE ownership, actually you know, as the company grows, increases economic inequality in our world because the gains disproportionately go to the small group of owners. Employee ownership actually helps distribute ownership to all employees and actually, so, you know, as a tool to overcome, you know, this horrible inequality that exists in our world, I think employee ownership is a really important and viable uh, model. Good, okay. Um, the uh, somebody's asked about activist hedge funds and long-term purpose. Oh, Louise, did you want? To add? No, no, no. The activist hedge funds. That's what I'm interested in. <laughs> yeah. So, what activist hedge funds are on the side of long-term purpose, climate, and SDGs? I know, Mark, you've written something about engine number one, and uh, and there's is this a trend? And maybe tell us a little bit about that story. Sure. Do you want me to jump in or Louise? Do you want to? Louise? Oh, I, I, I could set you up. Maybe you can tell the, the engine number one story maybe in detail. I just, one of the things we hadn't touched on, I'm so glad that question came was that, you know, you have CEOs routinely being fired for missing financial targets. And what we need is having CEOs fired for missing their social and environmental targets. And, and so 
you know, instead of saying, oh, we, should, we have to protect CEOs for, and ins insulate them from activist pressures, maybe we just need some, some more good activists. And in, in my world, and anecdotally, I'm seeing more of those. Um, and that I'll pass over to, to Mark to explain one of the, those, I guess. Yeah, sure. I mean, and Tima, yeah, you asked about engine number one. I mean, that's all on our minds with Exxon. Um, and yeah, that that, that article. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's it's early to tell, right? Activist hedge funds. So, you know, my research showing in general, overall, when we look at averages, that this is bad. That sustainability CSR purpose is undermined when these uh, when these campaigns happen and as they unfold. But as we're seeing, and it's fresh in our minds with engine number one, that you know some, some investors may be using activism for a different purpose, right? And I think where I'd say, maybe I'd, where, I, where I'd differ some of you and we can, we're running out of time, but unpack this is like, for me, it's with Exxon, what happened there and saying this company has no sustainability strategy. We can actually outperform, it can perform better if we make this, uh, energy transition and makes sustainability at the core. I mean, it's still early to tell. One one thing that sort of baffles me. This is a pickle we can like unpack later, not to distract. But you know, there's these conversations now that talking about. I think I saw a report from Bank of America saying Exxon could increase its dividend now, which should rise it raise its stock price by another forty five percent. And it's like. I don't know, it doesn't take a PhD in strategy to figure out if you're trying to transform a company for the long term, why are you raising your dividend? Why are you taking capital out of that company? Like everything should be putting back in. And so it's going to be super tempting for engine number one, like other hedge funds, that they have to outperform the market to get investment dollars. They've seen Exxon stock price already run up 50%. It can get up another percent. And then they're going to, it's going to be tempting to leave and go do that again. And where does that leave Exxon in this long term? Like that's where I don't know, Louise. You're more optimistic than I am, so I'm glad to, to hear you talk on this. But um, well, yeah. um, no, I think you're, I, I, there's a risk, right? There is always a risk. But I, for me, the positive is so. I happen to, you know, one of the new board directors at Exxon from that engine number one. You know, she's come out of Neste, who I mentioned earlier. Um, so has a tradition for transforming companies, um, and there is still the risk. Um, hmm. Yeah, I, I guess I, <laughs> I haven't got anything else to say, actually, that, that I, I guess I am just more optimistic um, because we're seeing some of these. And I guess the other changing tax just very slightly is we're also seeing some some brilliant organizations that are not hedge funds like Share Action, like actually Client Earth in Europe, um, who are lawyers, who are, are taking companies to task. Um, and, and using um, either the legal structures or um, or their shares in company who are you know to to shift things in a positive way and that's I think what we need to see more of and again back to the point made earlier that if individuals started taking more of an interest in the, where their pension and, and savings are going you know demand from your bank to figure it out most people if you pick up the phone to your pension company now or your bank they won't know exactly where your money is. It will take them a while. That you know, we need to start getting that accountability in there, but um, because that will it, help those people. I think it is well. really fascinating to see how uh, these activist hedge funds that they're on the other side. And you, that's what you're talking about, Louise. Mm -hmm. Is that there's activism that's really pushing towards ESG in the long term. That's countervailing some of the short-term pressures as well. So and we I would actually, have about, I'm sorry. No, I would actually not lump them in with the hedge funds. I mean, these are long-term investors that have that have strategy in many cases. I don't know engine number one as well, but you know, Trillium is a US based since 1980s has been doing this. There's a number of these companies that, you know, back to, you know, anti-apartheid and, and uh, you know, so I think this is, a, I, I am glad we touched on this and particularly with Mark and Louise's um, expertise that I do think that that investors are, have a huge role to play. And there's a lot of really positive activists that you know, need more support. And I think that you're absolutely right, that this has been going on a long time. And it's just that for the first time, it felt with engine number one, that they had the same tactics as the short-term investors right. and were just as effective as the short-term investors. Whereas before it was just felt like they were a pain in the company's side. <laughs> we have to, um, almost wrap up, we only have three minutes. So I'm gonna give you each just one final set of words that you want to say about 
Uh, is it rocky waters ahead for firms with purpose? Or do you think that there's, a, you know, that it's more smooth sailing, that we're actually seeing a brighter future? Comments, I don't know who wants to start. Uh, I can go first. Um, so my short answer would be, we are in transition. We are, with that sea ha tide hasn't risen yet, we're in turbulence and it will need um, a different type of leadership um, um, from CEOs and execs. But again, if we're all here in the long term, back to our climate crisis, then those are the ones who are going to be successful. Wonderful. Chris, I think you. Sure. I, I, I mean, I, I very much concur with Louise, and I think it's important to then not get fully discouraged when bad things happen, like, you know, the Danone case. I mean, it's going to be two step forward, one step back. We need to, you know, keep our foot on the accelerator and keep pushing for change to get through the period when we, periods when we do those one steps back. Fantastic. Mark? The last thing I'd add, I mean, I, I really hope so. I mean, I have my questions, I have my concerns, but I think it's going to take all of us. And it's just like anything else. It's collective action. It's people coming together. And hopefully we're see, seeing that transition. But it's going to take a lot of work to get there. A lot of things still have to change. Um, but, you know, hopefully what Louise and Chris have touched on and some of these smaller mid-sized companies coming up and more consumers caring about this, more investors that, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get there. Yeah, it's interesting. So I hear both optimism and hope. Uh, and and the other thing I'm hearing is, is it going to happen fast enough? So you're all optimistic and hopeful. But given all the really big issues they're facing us, can we get, do will organizations, corporations, privately held companies move fast enough? Or will we just, will they all have to die and be replaced by B Corps and, and, uh, <laughs> organizations with DNA, uh, ESG in their DNA. So, wow, that's a whole bunch of acronyms. I do want to thank everybody. We're at time right now. And so it's been really a pleasure, uh, especially Louise, Mark, and Chris. It's been a really dynamic conversation. I think a really important one, the one, one that's on a lot of people's minds. So thank you for the time that you spent today. I want to thank you for, to the audience that came for this event. And I think that uh, the questions that we saw were absolutely fantastic. Do send uh, your comments and feedback to nbs.net and uh, we would love to hear from you. And join our LinkedIn discussion, discussion group because we'd really like to continue this conversation. And so we will be writing back and forth and hopefully rope Mark, Chris and Louise into offering some ideas. That's it, everybody. Thank you very much.